It's good to have you all join us this hour as we have all come to study his word. It is uh, the most important thing that uh, anyone can devote his or her life, and that is to study the very word of God. The Bible tells us, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Grass withers, flower fades, but the word of God will abide forever. He will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. Trust in the Lord Jehovah, for underneath are the everlasting arms. Let's bow our heads in prayer as God uh, prepares us for this evening. Father God, thank you so much for this moment and thank you for the time you have given us, a refreshing time in your word. And uh, as David said, how blessed are those who don't take, who don't stand in the midst of uh, sinners or take counsel from those who do not know you. And above all, how blessed or equally are those who meditate on your word day and night. And he tells us, point blank, they will be like a tree planted by the stream of waters. They will never lack. They will produce. They will yield fruit all year round. And Father, this is exactly what we are doing right now, being planted in the stream of your waters, waters of the living world. And so as those who have taken their time, those who have tuned in, and even those who tuned in from overseas, we pray that you will bless everyone this hour. This is my prayer in Christ's name. Amen. We continue our study, The Heroes of Faith, a, a great book in the book of Hebrews, Heroes of Faith. In a, we have been, there are seven, uh, we divided this in our outline. Uh, so today we are picking up the part six. We, we, we have seven parts and uh, God willing by next week, we will finish chapter 11 the book of Heroes of Faith. And interestingly, why, we ask, why did the author bring all these men and women as a challenge to the church that he was addressing to? Remember, this church has been struggling. They have not been growing spiritually. And the author expresses his frustration in chapter 5. Remember, uh, look at Tom back again in chapter 5, where he expressed his frustration for lack of growth. In chapter 5, verse 12, for though by this time, that's, that's a slap in the face, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, that's not a good compliment. It's like turning to your child and telling your child it should be grown by now. Uh, or you're telling your member in the church you should be a teacher. You should be a teacher by now. And you're still hanging around in the baby class, in the uh, uh, children Bible class. You should be teaching them by now. And so the author was very frustrated here, as you can see, for by, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. There is nothing wrong about formula. Formula is meant for children, not for adults. Could you imagine coming home uh, as a father from hard work or as a mother and uh, what you are offered in the house, just formula, milk, 
well-balanced milk for your dinner. Where would that take you? You need more than a milk. You need a steak. You need, you need meat. You need something you can chew. But that's what he's telling them here. Uh, apparently, they have been believers for so long or children of believers for so long. And yet they, they were not growing. And that is the that seemed to categorize the church today. It's a character that we possess as a church, lack of growth, lack of spiritual growth. You cannot advance in the plan of God unless you are growing. And I want to ask, uh, challenge all of us here as we study and taking his word to ask ourselves question, this question, are we really growing? Are we really growing? How, how would you measure your spiritual growth on a scale of 10, 10 being spiritual maturity? How, where would you rank yourself even now uh, and uh, in, in comparison to when you became a believer? How long ago? Two years, three years, four years, five years, 10 years? Um, if you have been a believer more than two years and you're not making any spiritual growth, that's not good in your spiritual work with Christ. Uh, and the reason why I say that I can, Paul was with the Corinthians for 18 months. So he used that 18 months period to challenge them that they were not growing. And so if you have been a believer more than 18 months and you're not making any spiritual pro progress, it's just not good in fulfillment of the plan that God has for you. And then that's the question again, why did he write this? Again, he wrote it to challenge them as he is challenging us today. Uh, and in chapter 12, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. In chapter 12, verse one, He's going to bring all these things that he has been telling them in chapter 11. Therefore, remember what I said about therefore. Of course, the rule of biblical teaching is that whenever you see, it's a rule of thumb, whenever you see the word therefore, you need to pause and uh, try to find what the word is doing therefore. What is that word therefore doing? Well, the word therefore, it's like a glue. It brings what was said in the past, and that would be specifically chapter 11. And then projects what is to be said uh, in front of what was said in the past. So it's, a, it's, a, it's gluing two concepts, past concept and the new concept, therefore, therefore. It's like a bear, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses. Who are these witnesses? We have been told in the past that they were angels. Nope, they weren't angels. The witnesses here will stand to condemn all of us. The witnesses are where these people mentioned. They will stand to condemn us in our day, in our time for our spiritual failures. That's what the author is saying, therefore. Since we have this great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, they are surrounding us because they have exhibited what it means to live by faith and to glorify God to the maximum. And so they stand. Jesus, remember when Jesus Christ was talking in the in Matthew, he told them even what was done to Nineveh, if it was done to the people and the time he was preaching that something would have happened. And in fact, he told them that Nineveh will stand in the judgment to be a witness against them. And so when we get, I'm, not, I'm ahead of myself, but not so fast. And so he says, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance every weight, every entanglement. Have you ever seen anybody trying to run a race with a, a suit, coat and tie? 
Olympic. Have you seen anybody uh, or, a, or a lady with a gown or skirt or whatever and a high heel trying to run a race? That's a joke. Don't you think so? Those people look so, they, they, they can't even know that they are wearing anything. Why? Because they don't want air to or breeze to be a hindrance to drop, not even one iota of a slowdown. And you just see them so, so tight, ready to go. And that's what the author is saying. Let us remove every incomprehence and the sin which so easily entangles us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Back to our text. In chapter 11, Heroes of Faith. Today we pick up with uh, our subtitle is The Faith of the Exodus Generation. The Faith of the Exodus Generation. We're going to be looking at three verses, uh, as chapter 11, verses 29 through 31. And I will, by the Holy Spirit's enablement, we'll be able to unpack the truth that we have in these three verses. Turn with me, or just turn back to chapter 11, verses 29 through 31. The author tells them, by faith, they, the Israelites, passed through the Red Sea as though they were passing through the dry land. And the Egyptians were, when they attempted it, were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had encircled us for seven days. By faith, Rahab the harlot did not perish along with those who were disobedient after she had welcomed the spies in peace. And these three verses, they were loaded with nuggets of truth that we need to dissect. The heroes of faith, part six. So let's begin with the first one in verse 29. The faith of Israel in crossing the Red Sea. That is the A, if you like to put a, a, type, uh, a number, A will be the faith of Israel in crossing the Red Sea. By faith, they passed through the Red Sea as though they were passing through dry land. And the Egyptians, when they attempted it, were drowned. He could have just stopped by telling us that by faith, the Israelites passed the Red Sea. That would have been enough or that would have been sufficient to explain what he was trying to tell us. No, he added these Egyptians and what happened to them. Why did he add Egyptians and their own faith? I'm not, I'm not faith, trust, F-A-T-E, uh, their state. What happened to them? Well, the reason why he added this is to show us the contrast between faith and doubt between faith and doubt. The Israelites, when they were crossing, they, they didn't have any fear in crossing the Red Sea. They had already seen the work of God in Egypt and they had come to put their trust in him. And so when Moses, God told Moses what to do and he did, Israel saw the hand of God drying up an ocean instantly, bringing up, not just one thing is to dry, the ocean is probably, I don't know, maybe 100 feet deep or 200 feet or whatever cubic feet. It, it, it didn't just dry it up so that there will be uh, 100 feet deep. So that if you wanna cross, it doesn't matter, you still have to fall into the depth of the sea. No, he brought it up the land. He filled up the land. That's an amazing work of God. So it, it, it was flat, as if there was no, there wasn't any sea in the first place. So they marched, knowing who had done this, that it was their God whom they trusted. 
And, and of course, we know what happened after they crossed the other side of the uh, ocean. They all danced. They sang, who is like unto you. Uh, they sang with great voices. And so what about the Egyptians? They had courage. They had courage to pursue them. Theirs was courage. The Israelites, theirs were, they had faith. The difference, faith and courage. One can have courage and not have faith. You can have courage, but you don't have faith. Um, we're gonna, in, in, in a few, before we close, I'm gonna give us a few points in, in, in talking uh, so that we can add to whatever doctrine of biblical truth we have been building up regarding this faith. Faith is so crucial, so important. Faith is important in our relationship with God. We need to know how to uh, work on developing our faith. There are, there, is no, there are no two ways about it. Either you have faith or you don't. And if you don't, you are not pleasing God. I don't care how, what you do for God. I don't care how, much, how many times you go to church or tune in in the Bible class. If you don't have faith, the Bible said, I didn't say it. God himself said it. You don't please me. And that's Hebrews 9, 11 verse 6. With that faith, it is impossible. It, it didn't say it's hard. It said it's impossible to do whatever, to do what God would accept. And so this is why, that's why the, this chapter is so crucial to all of us. As we are studying this, we need to be asking ourselves question, this important question, how is my faith? How is my faith? Or how can I develop my faith? And we already, we already say that faith is developed by hearing and applying biblical truth. Faith comes by hearing. Paul tells us in Romans 10, 17. Where does faith come from? Paul tells us it comes from hearing the word of God. Hearing the word of God. Hearing the act. All the collections of God's work. That alone will put faith in your soul. And by hearing this consistently, constantly, you begin to grow. As you hear, hear this and apply, you, know, you don't just hear once and then. As you apply and see God respond to the application of your faith, it increases your faith, as we see in a moment. And so the Egyptians were drowned, but the Israelites were saved. The difference, one had faith, the other courage. Don't just count on your courage. Courage is not faith. They had courage. That's why they pursued them. They wanted to overtake them and kill them all. That was courage. But they didn't have faith that they will do the same thing they did. That brings us to the second B. If you, like again, if you are taking a note or if you are writing these points down, B. A is 29, B is verse 30, and the 31 will be C. B, Israel's faith in the cycling of the walls of Jericho. Israel's faith in the cycling of the walls of Jericho. What is, is interesting as you look at uh, this uh, study, uh, as we are just examining what happened or transpired uh, more than 3,500 years ago, to see what God did with these people, how God functions. Remember, as you study God, as you study his ways, as you study how he does things, what you may call modus vivendi or modus operandi, uh, how one is operandi, way of doing things, way of 
think in and Vivindi, apparently one of doing things and Vivindi way of thoughts, you are what you think. And so God, his ways are not our ways. Uh, you mark that down. Your way, your ways are not God's ways. How you conduct business is not how God conducts business. Quite a sharp difference. And he tells you how far it is, as heavens is so far from the earth. Those are the distinction between us and God. Like one said, he's God and we are not. And so Israel's faith in circling the walls of Jericho, it, 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 it kind of sounds silly. Somebody just tells you, go and circle it. Talking about, this is, this, when you talk about walls of Jericho, I saw when I was in Israel, they drove me by. I saw the, the kind of uh, uh, the 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 ruins or the left of or the what is left kind of uh, a monument pointing to what happened to the people of Canaan, uh, Jericho. Well, one of the things that in the ancient time, in the ancient time. This they they use walls as a protection, fortress. The bigger, the thicker, the taller your wall is, it guarantees safety. And they, they in in the in then they will have what you call what you describe as a uh, uh, a camel camel hole camel hole. So like a small gate where people are let in and out, let in and out. So that if you are a, if you are a, a, an army coming into the city, where would you come? The wall is so tall, you, you, you couldn't uh, use anything to break the wall. Where would you come? You can only come through that pigeonhole kind of. And by the time you put your head, it is chopped off. You put another head is chopped off until you all are finished. And people will even be on top of the wall throwing, throwing stones and the arrows and spears to protect their city. And no wonder when the spies came, they said, no way. There's just no way. This is impossible. Not only did they, not only did they have strong, strong fortress a wall, impenetrable wall, and the people living there also, as much is as they are as much as strong as the wall itself. They were giants, giants, uh, seven feet, eight feet, whatever, uh, weighing I don't know, five hundred pounds, seven hundred pounds. Could you imagine me uh, trying to? to fight someone weighing 500 pounds, eight feet or seven feet tall, you already know it's not a chance. And so that's what they saw. So I want you to keep that in mind. And God did not perform miracle and just all, all of a sudden the war is gone, but he told them what to do. As we saw in verse 30, he told them to cycle, cycle, go and circle the wall seven times. Seven times. Not six, not five, seven times. Interestingly, uh, whenever, I, whenever I see that passage, whatever, whether it's in the Old Testament and the New Testament, I remember, I remember uh, Dr. Stanley, you all know Dr. Stanley, and some of you do, uh, one of the uh, finest uh, Bible teachers uh, who lives in Atlanta, he, he gave a testimony of how they purchased their building. Uh, the, the building where they, build their, where, where they have their present church, uh, I think the, own, the owner didn't want to sell it or there was just some kind of uh, thing. But they needed that place because of his because it was in a strategic spot and that uh, they wanted that place. There's something about it. 
either, either the person knew that we are church or something. And so he told that uh, he told his uh, uh, dickies or his leaders, let us go and cycle that property <laughs> seven times. Well, it sounds so. Uh, it sounds uh, when I when I when I heard him say, give that as a testimony, I, it, it kind of chuckled me. But they did. Guess what? That's why they built their church. Whatever happened, that uh, however they applied their faith, it may be unconventional uh, to us or may not be practical to us. But they just did. I didn't see anything. I wouldn't condemn them because I didn't see anything that appears to be out of the realm of biblical teaching. Uh, I'm not saying, uh, you, you need to hear me very correctly. I'm not saying whenever you see a problem, go cycle it seven times. I didn't, I didn't, see, I didn't say that. But if you believe that within your heart that you need to cycle it seven times, you can go. I'm not going to stop you. But I, 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 I had similar experience, but mine, I didn't cycle it seven times. I did something different. Uh, that was the present place where uh, the church that uh, we now worship is located. And the uh, when uh, you have heard the story or the testimony of how the how we acquired the church, that church, when we bought the church, uh, when we say we, maybe only me, and uh, I don't even uh, at that time, I have not developed uh, members as such, not even strong members, uh, to be able to come together and have a plan in place and uh, plan to buy a building. I'm talking about buying a building. Renting is one thing, but buying a building is another thing altogether. In fact, where we were in a hotel, where we were worshiping in a hotel, we were struggling even to pay for our monthly rent in the hotel, let alone going to buy a building that was on the market for $1.1 million. But we did. When I saw, when uh, one of my church, uh, one of our uh, members or uh, GM members uh, showed me the church, the first thing I said to myself, we will have this church. We will have this building as our church, as our place of worship. How much do we have in the account? How much did I? It was, less than $600 in the account that I opened for church, less than $600. I said to myself, we will buy this church. And uh, I went on trip, on a mission trip, came back. The, the price had been dropped to $950. But not, that's not all. When, uh, when uh, I showed the, when my, I called on my agent, uh, uh, real estate agents, so we can look at the property. We went and the pastor and the, his own agent, we came and I looked at the church. I stood behind the pulpit as if I was preaching. I said, yep, I will preach from this podium. Remember how much we had? It's less than $600. And the members, a handful. And if you ask them all, if you tax them so much, I don't think they, they all of them, if you tax them, I don't know how much they will bring, but it's, it wouldn't be enough to even, uh, I don't know, I'm not going to say, I'm not gonna, I don't want to uh, accuse anybody, but uh, from what I know, from my own experience, from those that uh, were there, they didn't have, they were not uh, those millionaire lawyers and the doctors and the, they were just ordinary people, if you would, not people you would look to bring a good amount of money. But I knew God would give us that place. And so after we looked at the place, I didn't do what Stanley did, but I did something different. I would go, I would drop my daughter off at school 
and I would drive past my house and would go to the church. Seeing that I couldn't enter into the church, I would go to the back of the building. And there I prayed days, holding the church. I said, Lord, this is so centralized, so strategic. I need this property. And the end of the resort, the pastor came to my, to my office, said he loved what, what I am doing for the Lord uh, uh, through Grace Evangelistic Ministries, how we are reaching the souls. And he talked to his deacons and his leaders. They came back and said they had given, given us a credit of $200,000. That's down from 950 to 750. And that's by that by this time, those who heard what I was intending to do without asking them, please, I need money, I need they began sending on their own, sending money. In fact, the first person to give me money was my agent who was helping me buy. That's unheard of. I have lived in America for so long. I've never seen an agent give you money for buying your property. It doesn't happen. They want their commission. That's how they live. But for a real estate agent to tell me, Moses, uh, it has never happened to me before. It's impressed upon my heart to give you $10,000 toward this purchase. And she wrote a check for that. That was the beginning. Before I knew it, another 10000 came. 10000 came from somewhere. And we had enough to make a down payment for honest money. And I kept praying. And the owner told us, well, you need 35,000 honest money. But this, by this time, we already, had, we already have 35,000 in our account. And we said, no problem. It, 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 in fact, uh, there was a, a Jewish uh, community that came to buy that property for 950,000 cash. They turned it down. They said, we want to sell it to Moses. And God was working behind the scene because I, already, I had already asked him and believed that by and by, this church would be ours. And so by the time we finished, uh, they gave us time to close, but no bank, every bank was laughing at us. They said, how many members do you have? We didn't have members that you can say are very supportive or withdraw income on a monthly basis. They said, nope, that's a joke. It wouldn't happen. And some banks don't even return our call when we tell them and give them what we were trying to do. But I keep trusting God. The closing date came, it didn't happen. It didn't happen. I told them, can you give us more time? And the, the pastor and their leaders, they were willing to do whatever it, it takes to give us the property, to give us the church. And so what happened, the agent was so angry with the pastor and, and told him, look, these people came with this money, you rejected it. And this person that is trying to buy, it doesn't have the money. And uh, we will tell them one condition to extend this. They will forfeit 35,000 if they didn't close. And the pastor told me what they said. I said, bring the contract for the extension. If we don't close the day we ought to close, take 35,000. By the way, I didn't tell him that that's not my money. That's his money. He brought it in the first place. If, if he decides to take the money, that's his business. It wouldn't, it wouldn't bother me for one iota of time. I wouldn't even have sleepless night over it. He gave, he took it away. May his name be praised. That's probably what I would have said. Three days to the closing, the second closing, there was nothing, no bank. I tried every bank, email, everything didn't happen. Three more days for them to take the money and then we will say goodbye to the church. 
God somewhere, somehow, through a person. I didn't ask. It wasn't my, it's not in my, in my, my destiny to start calling people and say, raising money. I said, God, but some way, somehow, three more days, we got $182,000 in our account. And the pastor, the first thing he said when I told him, he said, praise God. He was so happy. And that's how quickly we had an, a lawyer, their lawyer who walked around the clock, contract was signed, keys of the church were handed to me. That's how we have that church. Faith does work. And God honors your faith when you apply it for the glory of his name. And so they were told to cycle. Look at verse 30. When he says, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encycled for seven days. God told them to go around. Don't do a thing. Don't hit. Don't try to check the foundation to, to see whether the foundation was strong enough. Just go around. Do what you are asked to do. Leave the rest to God. You see, in, in, in Christian life, if we as believers are doing our own portion of this bargain, things will run smoothly in Christian work, in the church, everywhere. Our problem is that we don't do what God has asked us to do. And sometimes we try to do his own. We, 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 we project our long purposes or our neck, uh, giraffe neck, into his own face, trying to see what God is doing and see if we can help him. Your job is not to worry about what he's doing. My job is not to even ring my fingers and see whether he would do his own portion. My job is to do exactly what he asked me to do. If I can obey him with all confidence, God will respond in kind. That was true of the woman of Jesus said that Elijah told, give, go make a food, Zerifat rather, go make a food for, my, for me first before you serve your family. There was only one portion left. And all she did was obey. In obedience of by faith, she did, not knowing what the result would be. And the result, as we know, was spectacular, incredible, outstanding, never ran out, never, never had uh, an empty jar uh, flowing with flour, with flour and the oil 24-7. God is faithful. And so when they cycled this seven times, you see, not the sixth time, nothing happened. Fifth time, nothing happened. God didn't say fifth time, didn't say fourth time, he says seven. In obedience, when they cycled the seven to one, trusting that God will do exactly what he will do because he has a track record of faithfulness. Guess what? At the seventh time, the walls of Jericho came down, crumbling, and everything fell apart. Israel's faith in circling the walls of Jericho. In these exercises, Israel had three things going for them. One, obedient faith. Obedient faith. They obeyed God. We should learn to obey God, obey Him. Uh, there's a song, the songwriter says, Trust and obey. Trust and obey. There is no other way. There's no other way to be happy in the Lord but to trust and obey. When you trust and obey, blessings overflow. When we trust and obey, we have nothing to be afraid of. We cannot, we don't have no reason to be afraid of the future. Because he is the one who holds the future. The one who asks us to trust and obey is the one who determines our destiny. Two, they had patient faith. Patient faith. Patient faith means 
They didn't quit in the middle of the third one, fourth one, fifth one. There was perseverance, perseverance, faith perseveres. They kept charging one, two, three. They knew that nothing will happen in the, on the fourth or fifth, sixth. They were looking forward to the seventh one. And that brings the thought, the thought, the, uh, uh, the third thing they had, they had anticipating faith, anticipating faith that they will, it will happen as they had been told. It will happen, anticipating faith. That's what Mary had when he was told that he will have a baby. She was anticipating the fulfillment of this promise. And this brings us, we see that's how they went in by the promise and the word of God they went in. This brings us to the last verse, verse 31, and that is C, the fate of Rahab the harlot. Uh, the fate of Rahab the harlot, a Canaanite woman, a Canaanite woman of Jericho. It's interesting that the Bible, wherever that name is mentioned in the Bible, and attached to that name is the word prostitute or harlot. <sighs> God, the way he does this is it's not the way we do things. We would have said, drop that name by now. This woman is a clean woman. No, that name followed her. And why did that? Why, why, why do you think the name follows her? To show us that that's the type of people God uses to accomplish his purpose. People who failed miserably in life, but he realizes that they have failed and they, in true repentance, turn to God and who heartedly seek him. And those people, God not only allows, allows them to find him, but he uses them to do great things in life, to show us his character how compassionate, how compassionate he is as God. God is a compassionate God, merciful God. That is to tell us there is no failure on our path that is too great, too grave for the grace and awesome mercy and kindness of our great God. No failure. There is no way. You cannot fail God. I don't care how much you have. I don't care what your failure looks like. And the question is, can you in true repentance, pick up the pieces, approach God with open heart, and God will meet you with a clean, he will, he will take your old slate and throw it out in the pit behind his back, or throw it in the depth of the sea, and he will hand you a brand new one, as if you had not done anything wrong. That's our God. That's the God of Rahab, the prostitute, or Rahab, the harlot. So don't let the devil tell you that your failure is too great, that your time is over, that your life is over. Not with this God, and not with what I'm reading here in, the, in our text. Rehab, in the book of Joshua, her name appeared five times. In Joshua chapter 2, verse 1, 2, verse 3, in, in chapter 6, verse 17, and the, chapter 6, verse 23 and 25. And in our in New Testament, you see her name again at least three times. Uh, uh, the first place you see that name is in Matthew chapter 1, verse 5. It, it'd be nice if we can just visit that passage, Matthew chapter 1. Let's see how God works. Don't forget the name Harlot. Harlot, somebody who made her body kind of a uh, a, a depot, depot, depot for men. In other words, a, a hub, a bus stop. In the ancient time, that's a name you don't want to be associated with. But she was. Verse 5. And to Salmon, Salmon was a prince, a prince of Judah. Prince of Judah. And to Salmon was born Boaz by Rahab. Remember Boaz? Boaz, who married uh, Ruth, 
don't you? Salmon was a prince, a prince. And when I wanted to get that, a prince married a harlot <laughs> in Israel. That's, that's a name you don't want to be associated with. That you are a harlot, a, prost a prostitute. But a prince of all the beautiful women in, his, in, in, in Israel. She was only, he was only drawn to this prostitute. But at this time, she was no longer a prostitute. She had changed. She had turned. She had turned her life upside down by true obedience to the teaching of the word of God. So, and to Solomon, Solomon was born Boaz by Rahab, and to Boaz was born Obed by Ruth, and to Obed Jesse. And when you see that, that Rahab was that prostitute. You see, the line of Jesus Christ didn't come from beautiful, beautiful line. If I had a choice, if, he, if I had been assigned to select the line of Jesus Christ, I would look for the best people. I would look for people that, are, that, that have integrity, people you can respect in town, people when you call their names, you say, wow, thank God, that's where he came from. No, God bypassed such area. When you read, you can read and read, keep going and going. You read uh, Rahab, you will read Root, Root from a pagan nation. You, you, you come to David, you find Solomon by, by Beersheba. Uh, uh, um, it's a Beersheba. You may it's just it's just thinking that you may forget who who the Beersheba here was. Matthew will tell you it was the Beersheba, the wife of Uriah, the one that David murdered the husband and took forcefully. And that was for all the people. David had enough children to fill the community. Of all the children, all the sons. The only one God chose was the one he calls his pet. He chose Solomon. And that's actually what that name is. So, uh, the, the Solomon wasn't the name God gave to the son. That's a different story. But Rahab, what do we know about Rahab? Rahab also shared in the faith, great faith. In, 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 in James 2.25, James 2.25, that name also appeared again. And in the same way was not Rahab, the harlot, again, the name of attached, the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. Justification by reward, of course, is not for salvation at this time, because she was already saved before he justified, before he sent those people away. How do we know that Rahab was already saved? Turn to Joshua chapter two. Remember when Joshua told the, the spies to go, you know, when, when Moses sent the spies, Joshua, rather, Joshua chapter 2, sent people to take a recognize <laughs> slip of tongue. And I, I don't want to blame it on my jet lag. Joshua chapter 2, verse 8. Let's see what uh, verse 8 through 14. Let's look at this woman we call Rahab. What's the difference? How did she get to the point where she trust, she, she came to trust God? Verse 8. The, the spies had already entered. Joshua had already sent them. They had already entered into the land to take kind of inventory how they will enter this land and possess it. Well, they met up with this woman. And this woman hid them 
away from the authorities who were looking for them. And verse eight, this is what he, she told them. Now, before they had, before they laid down, she came up to them on the roof where she hid them and said to them, I know, see, knowledge. Remember those of you who listened to the 14 reasons why we should be anxious for nothing. I say knowledge, my knowledge of one, my knowledge of two, my knowledge of three. Your knowledge is so powerful in protecting you in, a, in your spiritual life, the same way it protects me in my spiritual life. Verse 8, now before they lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the terror of you has fallen on us and that all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you. I know, you already have the land. We have big walls. So what? Those words will not save us from, your, from the mighty hand of your God. That means she had come to put faith in Yahweh, Jehovah God, Jesus Christ of the Old Testament, whose only name can bring salvation to any, every mankind. As Peter tells us in Acts 4, 12, there is no other name given whereby we'll be saved. Salvation has always been through Jesus Christ, whether from Adam, from Adam and Adam and Eve, all the way to the millennia, to the last person who will believe in G Jesus Christ in millennia, have only been saved through one man, Jesus Christ. We know your God is awesome God. Verse 10, for we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan to Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. What did this woman, this woman, you can see when we get to chapter 12, you can see why the author said they are surrounding us, they are witnesses surrounding us. What is she, she didn't have any law. She didn't have any book, no page of the Bible. Just hearing what God was doing, but you and I, we have completed, let me lift it up so you can see it. We have completed the canon of scripture, revelation to Genesis to Revelation in different languages, different translations. We have it color, red, blue. We have all kinds, whatever you need. And yet it's difficult for us to excise common faith in trusting God. This woman just heard, and, this, and her faith was so strong. Just by hearing what God was doing outside, not even in their own country, she just heard it. She just heard what God performed. And we have heard so much. We have raised so much. Is our faith growing? That's a question we need to ask ourselves tonight. Is our faith growing? Verse 11, and when we heard it, our hearts melted and no courage remained in any man any longer because of you. For the Lord, you are God. He is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Here she ex expresses her faith. How are we saved? Faith alone in Yahweh alone in the Old Testament or faith alone in Christ alone in the New Testament. The same person, Abraham believed in the Lord. Genesis 15, 6. His faith alone was credited to him for righteousness. Salvation has always been by faith. And by faith alone. In verse 12. Now, therefore, please swear to me by the Lord, since I have dealt kindly with you, that you also will deal kindly with my father's household and give me a pledge of truth and spare my father and my mother and my brothers and my sisters with all who belong to them and deliver our lives from death. You see, they have not even conquered yet. The giants were still there. But he, she knew that that same God who had walked with them in Egypt, that same God who dried the Red Sea, that same God who provided manna for them. That same God who had been successfully, faithfully protecting them, providing for them, being a pillar of fire by night, 
uh, and a cloud, a pillar of cloud by day, following them for 40 years. That same God they, she heard of, we see them through. And when he finally did, remember me. That's a fate that God rewarded. Remember what he said in Hebrews eleven six, He's a rewarder of those who have faith in him. And this woman, a harlot, the Bible keeps pointing to, to you so that you, you will really know who this woman is. Not that she was the most righteous person on earth. A harlot, a prostitute, an outcast of the society. God rewarded her, spared her only, and destroyed the whole city. That's how God works. That's the power of faith. Don't throw away your faith. Don't cast it away. When things are going tough in your life, that is not the time to cast away your faith. Rather, it is a time to increase, to intensify your faith in God, trusting that he, he, he who has promised, as he says in Hebrews, in Hebrews 10, he who has promised is faithful. As, he, as God made a promise to us, he will bring that promise to a conclusion. And so points of truth, these four points I told you I, I I'll bring as I close quickly. Points of truth, one. Points of truth. To trust God is to believe in his faithfulness. To trust God or to have faith in God is to believe in his faithfulness. Active faith believes God no matter the odds, also, no matter the odds of success, for success. Active faith believes God no matter the odds for success. In other words, you believe God regardless of how the atmosphere looks like. You believe God regardless of what the condition looks like. You believe God like Abraham did. Believe in God without wavering when everything doesn't look right. Active faith believes God no matter the odds for success. Three. I'm sorry, yeah, yeah, two, rather two. Active faith believes God, yeah, number three, rather. Active faith believes God's, God's word, even when it does not make sense. Active faith believes God's word, even when it does not make sense. If you figure it out, then it's no longer faith. If you sit down to make sense out of what you are told to do, if it is God saying it, it's not, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to tell me to go take my foot and touch in the water. God, why don't you just dry the land and let me pass by? Why should my foot? You know, it was like as if that's what he told Joshua. Finally, number four. God rewards those who have faith in him no matter the circumstances. God rewards those who have faith in him, no matter the circumstances. And so my brothers and sisters, we now take the position of the Hebrews to whom the author wrote this powerful epistle. As, as Paul tells us in, in Romans 15, that these things that have been written now, they have been written for us, for our own betterment for our own benefit. Let us take the word of God that we hear seriously. It's not like Moses said, Moses of the old said in Deuteronomy, it is not ordinary word. In fact, it is our life. Let's take this seriously. Let's take the study of his word seriously. Let's take the application seriously thereof. For he will reward us over and over and over. He's a merciful God, gracious God, who wants to give us more than we can ever imagine or even 
our mind fathom, as he says in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, is able to give us more than we ever ask or even think or even imagine. That's our God. He's waiting to do so. But we must develop the capacity necessary for us to enjoy the blessings that he has for us. And I want to, again, thank you for taking the time to join us in the study of his word, the word of life, as Peter calls it. Holy God, we are so grateful to you and to you alone for your infinite mercies, for your compassions, for your love, for your goodness, for your mercies. You've been so good to us, so kind to us, that we have failed you in so many ways. And that's a known fact. I have failed you. And so do many of the people who, have, who are listening this moment, they too have failed you. No wonder why Jeremiah lamented, these are recorded to mind. Therefore, I have hope. It is of the lost mercies that we are not consumed. For his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Thank you for such a faithful, for, for, for the ground uh, picture of your faithfulness, that, or the banner that has been lifted up for us to see. You are so good. Thank you for your people that tune in every every Wednesday night or morning, those who tune in from overseas. Uh, like uh, last week, somebody who tuned in uh, from overseas, that person's time was actually 3 a.m. The person had to withhold the sleep or not only one person, they had to hold off their sleep in order to join in in, your, in the teaching of your word. And Father, for these people, I pray that you will bless them immensely in a special way, that they will know that their time invested in the study of your word is never in vain. And for those of us here who just uh, still tuning in at the time we ought to tune in, bless us equally. Continue to cause us to grow in our faith, to grow in the, in the grace of our Lord and in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Help us in times such as this. Continue to protect us from this deadly virus. And for those of us who may have come in contact with this virus, protect, heal, deliver, and keep us afloat in the devil's world. And we just ask that you help us to fulfill the plan that you have set before us. Let us do so with gladness, with great joy. And Father, we can't thank you enough. Personally, I can't thank you enough for all that you do for us. May your joy, your peace continue to reign in our hearts supremely. May your peace be ours in abundance. Even as we go to bed, let us not remove these anxieties and worries from us and grant that we will have good night rest, waking up, realizing that our God is still in charge. He is still in control of the universe. Thank you again for this word. Thank you for the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Keep our hearts burning for your kingdom. Keep us knitted in your love. Today, tomorrow, until Jesus returns. This is my prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.